Okay, Hebrews 12, um, and let's read verse 12. It says, therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. But let's read it again. That's it. That's just the two verses we're going to study um, this morning. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and make your paths for your feet, make straight paths for your feet, excuse me, comma, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Um, let's, let's call this message um, um, Hands and Knees, okay? Do you remember that song? I, it always, I can't remember the lyrics. Finger, knees, and toes. Shoulders, knees, and toes. Is that a, that's not a Bible. Oh, I thought it was, okay. Oh, Judah, that's Father Abraham there, slugger. Okay, we get it. Come on. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There's no such thing as secular and sacred. It's like a little heavy for the morning. Okay. Um, would, you, would you pray with me? I love you guys a lot. You're the best looking community I've ever seen. And, um, and I'm not lying this time. Sometimes preachers lie. Did you know that? It's my favorite church to preach in, you know, on this particular Sunday. Okay. Jesus, thank you so much for your grace and for your love for us. Um, Lord, I, I am asking that you would take this um, really um, what, what could be potentially ordinary Sunday, and you would make it extraordinary. Already so many of us in, this, in the room at the same time is, 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 is pretty special. So we ask that you would meet us right now and that you would encounter us. And God, take your word, bring it to life and use it to build our spirits and souls on the inside in a real, genuine, legitimate, authentic way. That's what we need. Make this more than a sermon and a talk. Let it be a word from heaven. Thank you, Lord. Don't let Tom Brady win any more Super Bowls. I do half-heartedly ask that you would bless the Miami Dolphins and prepare us for Super Bowl 52, the Seattle Seahawks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Will you come back? Okay, thanks, man. How long have you been growing your hair, bro? A year and a half. True story. Come on, I liken you to Samson in the scripture. You know, it's like, no, you're not Samson. I'm just kidding. Is your name Samson? Um, so if you don't know, uh, my name's Judah. This is my wife, Chelsea. And uh, we have been married for uh, coming up on 18 years. 18 years. Insane. And uh, gosh, I have made her a better woman. But that's not the point. I've really molded her. I've kind of been like a spiritual father to her, raising her. Um, we got married so young, you know? But um, we've had, we have three kids now, and so Zion's about to be 13. Zion's our firstborn, and then our um, second son, Judah Elliot Wendell Smith. His initials are Jews, God's chosen people, and uh, it was intentional. And um, <laughs> last night, John Gray was like, Jesus is not this ethnicity, this ethnicity, and I was like, he's Jewish. You know, I like, <laughs> just wanted to say that, because he is. But anyways... Um, uh, he's still Jewish in heaven. Do you know that a Jew, we will be greeted by a Jewish Jesus, just by the way. He is still... Anyways, okay. So, um, so Jews, and then, and then the third uh, uh, child is my favorite of the three, the little girl, and um, her name is Grace Renee, and uh, oh, I love her so much, man. She cuddles with me in the morning, and um, she pretends like she doesn't like that I pinch her buns. You know what I mean? I don't know when that's not okay anymore. I don't know the line. I really don't. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, she's going to be like 16. I'm like, oh, I love you, sweetie. You know, like, uh, dad. Yeah. So we're still working through kind of when that's, I keep checking in with Chels. Are we good? Um, but you should see these little buns and like the little Lululemon. Oh, oh man. Right. And I just can't handle it. And so anyways, I, I, I love the kids and, and, and I, they're all my favorite, right? I mean, if, if to, to, to be honest, I got an email one time from a lady, actually it wasn't an email. Why would I say email? It was face to face. And it was after one of the services like this one, I said that I have a favorite child and she's like, it's really indiscreet and inappropriate for a pastor preacher to have a favorite child like that. That's not how God works. And so, you know, I punched her, but, um, <laughs> oh my God, you guys, come on. It's a joke. Um, but, uh, 
So I don't have, it's like whatever child you're with, if you have multiple children, whichever one you're with is your favorite. It's just hard to like, your heart just swells, it gets bigger, it it is what it is. Um, But there is, of the three, one that really, really can get under my skin. And wouldn't you know, it's the one who's always most like you, okay? Now, if you're not a parent, consider yourself blessed. But, um, come on, children are a blessing, they're in arrows in our quiver. Um, but it, but it's, it's Judah Elliott Wendell Smith, right? We're the same guy. We're the same dude. And of course, if, if you have a child that's like you, the reason they drive you nuts is because you want to stop them. The road they're on is going to be laden with pain and dysfunction. You're like, don't go my way, son. It will not be well for you. There's much, much much pain this way, right? This emotional instability, it will not serve you well. Ask your mom, you know, like she deals with it here. So uh, Judah Elliott Wendell Smith is, he's all heart, okay? And by describing my son, I'm also simultaneously describing myself, okay? But it just is what it is. He's he's all heart. Um, He can be discouraged by the smallest of things, but when he wants to, he can really focus on really, really difficult things, okay? But, 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 the two Judas in this amazing um, woman's world, um, you just pray for Chow, okay? Like, pray for my wife. It is challenging. I'll give you for instance, okay? You're like, what do you mean easily discouraged? Elliot and I are easily discouraged, okay? I, for instance, I'm, I don't Google well. Now, that, you might find that to be like, that's not true. It is true. Like, I don't, I don't Google well. Googling frustrates me. When I say frustrate me, like, I literally get down. My head drops because Chelsea will be like, let's Google it. I, I, I'm not a good Googler. I think there are good Googlers and I think there are bad Googlers. Okay, like preparing a sermon, getting up preaching, not a problem. Googling, please, please don't make me do it. Okay, because what ends up happening, like I'll Google like when are the Seattle Supersonics going to come back to Seattle, right? <laughs> And I'll Google something like that, and before I know, I'm, I'm on some East Coast high school named the Sonics, and I'm reading about some father-son dynamic relationship drama, and I'm like lost, and then I like come up to, for air, and I'm like, wait, what was I? I just, it's too much information. I can't, some of you are good Googlers, you don't even realize it, right? Because you're 12. But you just like, <laughs> someone says Google it, you Google it, and you have an amazing article, you know, printed in the Huffington Post about everything you want to know about. I can't find the right information. I always find the wrong information or end up buying something on eBay, you know, after I've been Googling. So I get frustrated. I see this in L Doc, right? He's easily discouraged. Now, if this morning you are one of us, you are easily discouraged, welcome to the party, okay? We're in this together. We're going to be all right. Don't be discouraged about being discouraged. That's part of the problem, okay? I have learned over the years that, you know, we all have our propensities and our weaknesses. And I realize, and so does Chelsea now, that my discouragement is not some uh, horrific, uh, dumb thing I did. It's just kind of in the DNA. And she sees it now in L-Dog, and we have like this moment like, wow, it's really, yeah, it's just in there. And of course, L-Dog, like his dad, um, we're generally pretty nice people, but if you push us far enough, um, we'll kill you. Right, so Elliot is, is, is he, he's, he's way bigger than his older brother, okay? And, and his older brother will push him, push him, push him, push him, and then you hear death, okay? And Zion is running for his life as Elliot has lost his mind. And I'm literally, somebody like, is your, is your family okay, bro? <laughs> no, we're not actually, thanks for asking. Um, but I gotta hold this guy back, and he just kind of loses his awareness because there's just something in him. It's, it's, it's kind of DNA, and of course, God can help us through our DNA. But if you're easily discouraged, all I'm saying this morning is I can completely relate. Have you ever felt 
discouraged. Now, that's an interesting word in church life because when I put, when I put out the word discouraged, that has become a, a very heavy term and a very intense terminology, ch- ch- church-wise, that is. Now, if you're kind of new to, new to this space, new to community, the word discouraged maybe uh, isn't a, a, a horrible title to you. But for many of us in church, the idea of I'm discouraged is kind of the, the it's, it's, it's synonymous with admitting you're defeated. And so if you've been in church for any length of time, you know that that's not, you don't show up at church and go, I'm discouraged, especially if you're a leader, because you, 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 you can't be. You have to, joy is a choice, Judah. Welcome to my childhood, okay? Right, no, I can't, you can't be discouraged. So when I say, are you discouraged, maybe something goes off inside of you because you've been in church long enough to go, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm not like discouraged, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm not discouraged. Let me describe it to you like this then, okay? We've just read two verses from Hebrews chapter 12. Context is we've got ancient Jewish believers, okay, Jews who have left the synagogue, left the temple. They have now accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Jesus has now fulfilled the law. Their life is no longer dictated and determined and defined by the law, but now it's by relationship and worship to Jesus who has fulfilled the law once and for all for them. They've accepted him, and now they're going to live the Jesus life and the Jesus way, and everything was going great until persecution just seeped in, and now all of a sudden new regimes, new kings, new kingdoms, and all of the sudden the Jewish believers are not liked in the streets of their city. And so all of the sudden they're getting discouraged. And so the writer of Hebrews says, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Now he, 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 the, 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 the author doesn't literally mean some of you have very long arms. Pick them up a little bit. Okay. Some of you MCL, ACLs, fix them. We got, no, 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 no. He's, it's a metaphor. But clearly by this metaphor, it is very evident to me that God has something for these Hebrews to do and somewhere for them to go. I'd like to say to Vu Church this morning, God has something significant for you to do and some very significant places for you to go. We've got to keep moving. We've got to keep moving. Now, the, 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 the... the greatest problem with discouragement, and we're going to define it in a moment, so we'll put a pin in that, the, great, the, greatest, the greatest challenge is discouragement causes you, very simple, to stay where you are. We get so hung up on these terms, and there's so much uh, jargon in the church, and, and the meaning is lost. When, when we say quit, a lot of people believe that means going back. Quitting can just simply be staying right where you are. Right? So you, we can't stay right where we are. We've got to keep moving. Now, the drooping hands imagery, first of all, I know why hands are before knees, because if you have drooping hands, hands is a picture of strength and strength in scripture always. And so hands means your strength is drooping, your strength is waning. And when your strength is low, your activity is limited. So if you've got little strength, knees are a picture of action or movement or activity in scripture. So when you have low energy, you have little activity. And so clearly the writer of Hebrews is saying, I need you to increase your energy and and, and intensify your activity. And so I'm telling Vu Church that we've got to increase our energy because God has so much more activity for us to be involved in, right? So when I said discouraged, you probably didn't think low energy towards God. But that's actually what discouragement is. It's actually when you, it's very simple, it's very, I'm kind of, it's kind of clinical, it means you have low energy towards God. And you know, a lot of people think low energy towards God's a bad thing. You know what, sometimes it's outside of your circumstances and situations and you can't control it. Now, I've been taught all my life, in, in, in many cases, that you know, discouragement is your fault. Sometimes low energy towards God is because your friends are being killed for loving Jesus. You know what, my energy meter would probably go, Like, God, what's going on? Have you ever had low energy towards God? Now, be careful when you have low energy towards God because that's when you make dumb decisions, Esau. When we have low energy towards God. God. We, it's like your body, right? When your body is, usually if you're eating clean, right, especially early on in changing your diet, your body will need energy. And what will it crave for energy? Cheap 
fake energy through white refined sugar. And it'll give you a high and then it'll crash. We do the same in our spiritual journey. When we crave energy towards God, we use stimulants that are not scriptural, they're not satisfying, they're not fulfilling, and they take us on a high and then we plummet into even a worse low. Right, so what happens when you have low energy towards God, you have little activity, and before you know it, the church becomes a monument, right, and not a movement, and we're no longer active in the city because we have low energy towards God. Hey, are you discouraged? No, 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 I'm fine. Do you feel a little less energy than normal for God? Yeah. Okay, that's a form of discouragement, and you're not alone. It's been happening for a long time in the church. Now, interestingly enough, the writer here is writing to a collective. He's writing to a community. He, this is plural. It's plural even in its format. The writer is speaking plural here. So there's not like a few people with low energy. There's a lot of people with low energy. And sometimes that happens in church. And I want to go on record to say that doesn't make you bad or weird or not okay. It's sometimes life in the big city. So the writer says, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Now, at first glance, it sounds like he's saying what my math teacher used to say to me, which is, Judah, what are you doing? Right? And she'd walk by my desk, and I'd be in like pre-algebra, which I was there for three years. And I, (laughs) don't laugh, man. That's a real thing, okay? So I'm like... She'd be like, what are, what are you doing? And, and I look up at her and I would say this, I don't know. That's my point. I don't, show your work. I don't know how to do that either. How'd you get the answers from her? <laughs> I was talking to a friend recently. I'm like, did you cheat in school? He's like, oh my gosh, absolutely not. I was like, I absolutely did. So I'm just going on record to say that, you know, I graduated with a 2.9 that belonged to a lot of my friends. <laughs> Right, because when you don't know how to do something, you don't know how to do something. So the writer of Hebrews says, hey, you have low energy towards God, pick it up. And your response, if you're honest, is I would if I could. I don't, I don't, I don't know how, like, hello, these, these are friends of people that are being killed for their faith. And the writer of Hebrews has the gall, nerve, and the audacity to say, hey, 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 pick it up. We would if we could, gee whiz, like we're out here getting killed, right? Now, again, this is the problem with reading just a couple of verses and not understanding what's going on, because a few verses before, in fact, throughout this letter, the writer of Hebrews has told the community of Hebrew believers how to increase their energy towards God. He's already done that. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, for instance, in verses 1 and 2. Maybe you've heard these before. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, sin which clings so closely, let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Looking, looking, verse 2, looking, looking, looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, verse 3. Looking to Jesus, verse 3, consider him. You know how you get your energy back? You know how you get your energy towards God back? You've got to look to Jesus and consider him. So how do we do that? Here's what we have underestimated in community life, in church life. We have underestimated spending time with each other talking about God. And we have, we, we really have. Singing is definitely in the Bible. Preaching, definitely in the Bible. I could argue in the New Testament teaching that talking to each other about God is more prevalent and more prominent than even being told that we're to sing together and preach at each other. 
We need to spend time. This is something I've just been on lately in community life, and I believe it will increase the energy of VU Church if we will spend time. We're talking about VU Cruise, and it sounds super cool, and you are a very handsome man, and it's like, wow, this is VU Cruise, so cool. No, 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 no. What we're trying to do is live out the scripture because I need you to tell me about what God has done in you because that will shoot adrenaline in my soul. I I need to get my energy back. I... I need you. Remember now, this is plural. This is a group project. We need to do this together. We need each other. Looking to Jesus, consider him. I say it like this. We've got to stay in the story. Please hear me, Vu Church. We've got to stay in the story. As I said a moment ago, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. What does that tell us about the universe? The universe is the story of God. The glory of God is the story of God. And the story of God is being played out in the earth, and it includes South Beach, and it includes whatever city, barrio, neighborhood, or hood you are from. It includes that. It is God's story. It's actually not your story. It's actually not my story. We got inserted into his story, and his story has been going on for thousands of years. The mountains declare his story. The rivers declare his story. The architecture declares his story. Art declares his story. It's all his story. What happens is because we have become so individualized in our living and our thinking is we fall for that age-old trick to believe, this is my story. It's a fine term, my story. I'm not against that. I'm just saying as long as we understand contextually, it's actually literally, really, truly, actually not figuratively his story, and I'm just happy to be inserted. (laughs) Wow. I kind of got big pictures. So we got to stay in the story. Best way we stay in the story is get together, be together, and remind each other, hey, 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 hey. I know you lost your job, but this is his story, and it's going to be played out. And God is good, and he is faithful, and he is true, and his story is being played out in in the earth. So it says, strengthen your, or, 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 or lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And he goes on and he says, so, so, verse 13 And make straight paths for your feet. That's interesting. Make straight paths for your feet so what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Make straight paths for your feet. That's interesting. Make straight paths for your feet. Now, again, this is plural. The plural. It's actually written in plural. So he's talking to an entire community, much like this room, and he's saying, make straight paths for your feet. What could that mean? Now, if you know anything about the Hebrew people, they were nomadic people. They were walking people. And so there's much to be said about how these ancient Hebrews would know about their ancestors and all the walking they did. And so the metaphor would have hit home a bit more than the metaphor would for us today living in South Beach. You know, it's like make straight paths for your feet. Like when's the last time you went hiking? You know what I mean? So this isn't Seattle. But um, make straight paths for your feet. Of course, it's rooted in this this Jewish history that they would literally clear out the path and they would remove rocks and they, I think the glory of the Lord just showed up. Do you guys see that? The cloud of God. I mean, I, I can't see you. I just hope you can see me. But um, it's cool. Is somebody smoking back there? Come on. You'll go to heaven smelling like hell. Okay. So <laughs> I don't know. I've been in church so long. Like I got all the line, the one liners, you know? Um, so what's important here this morning is do you guys ever have dramas at your church? We had, we had drama like Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames, and this is what it was like, you know? And anyways, okay. This is a, it's a good stance. <laughs> okay. I don't know where we were in the sermon because I can't see you! <laughs> Kidding. It's, it's actually super important to have this much fog. <laughs> okay. So making... Making straight paths literally meant they would actually, ancient Jews would remove rocks and roots and, and, and they would fill up holes so that the Hebrews would have straight paths, it would be clear. So now the writer is taking an ancient metaphor picture and he says, hey, make straight paths for your feet. What could he mean? What could he mean? What could he mean? Okay, so he's talking here to the whole church 
And he says, make straight paths for your feet. What he's not talking about is their corporate gatherings. He's actually not at all referring to their Sunday morning meetings. He's talking to them now about their everyday lifestyle. And he says, I want you to make straight paths for your feet. And I'd like to say something to Voo Church, if I could be so bold. I think I got a holy hunch, right? Another thing I heard preachers say, a holy hunch that God is asking people in this church and community to live the life that you are graced and aided and helped by the Spirit of Jesus himself to live. When he says make straight paths for your feet, what he's actually saying is it is far past due for men and women in this ancient community to step up and live consistent lives, consistent in your actions, consistent in your words, consistent in your walk, consistent in your attitude. You know what this is? It's a call for level living. Level living. Just level living. Now, if you're like me, again, going back to the emotional instability that I have obviously granted my second son, is I am given to high highs and low lows. In fact, I love the high highs, and in a sick, sadistic sort of way, sometimes I like the low lows. Do you know what I mean? You ever just like being down? Like, I'm so down. <laughs> right? But here, the writer of the Hebrews is pleading, saying, would you lean in and start developing a level life? You know what's crazy? Is I think sometimes it takes more faith, more faith to live a level Monday than take some incredible mission trip somewhere to the ends of the earth and dig wells. Right? And it, are, we, are we humorous or is that just me? We never even met the person that lives in the condo next door. But boy, send us to the ends of the earth and we will dig wells and hold babies and take pictures. You know what I mean? Like me too though, me too, I'm in this too. Chelsea's like, let's go meet our neighbors. Ah, sports center's on. <laughs> Whoo, I can't wait to preach Sunday. What is wrong with me? Judah, let's go meet our neighbors. Uh, babe, I'm, I'm prepping a sermon here. Wait a second, right? Let's this level living. Whatever happened to level living? Just consistency. We, we've said it a million times. Come on. If you're looking to get married, honestly, 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 consider the level people. Consider the consistent people. By the way, if they dress bad, who cares? You can do a makeover. That's part of what marriage is about. Find somebody who is Steady. All right, I've said it before. Sexy Steve. No offense, bro. We love you. You are so overrated. You can be so sensational sometimes. You really can't, and we love you. But Steady Eddie always wins in the end. Right? We want to be, hey, 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 hey. The life you're living for Jesus right now, is it sustainable? Is it sustainable? We're loading in, we're loading out, we're starting Voo Church, it's just getting going, but there is a call for God to say, hey, let's live in such a way that you can do this for a long time. Long time, right? Voo Church is gonna be here for the long run. We're not going anywhere, right? We're gonna be better at 70. Church is gonna continue to grow. We're gonna get older, we're gonna get gray hair, we're gonna raise our babies and our grandbabies, right? That's what we're gonna do. We're not gonna be always 28. That's okay, we're gonna stay young in our attitude, but our bodies won't. That's okay. Boo Church is not anchoring itself to an age demographic. That's, that doesn't define who we are. We're for all people, and we're gonna be here for a long time. So the call is for level living, con consistency, and the greatest enemy of your level living are, are, are holes in, in the, not, not roots, not rocks, it's the holes, it's the holes. And do you know what the holes typically are? It's um, social breakdown, that's all it is. It's relational breakdown, it's relational breakdown. I'm telling you something, Voo Church, you will never be stopped by the outside. The only way this church can be stopped is from the inside. 
and the inside is where hurt goes undealt with, and Matthew chapter 18 is not lived out. And those holes will get bigger and bigger and bigger. But if you will take the step to go to that somebody or that special sister or brother who hurts you and annoyed you and bothers you, and you'll do it immediately and say, hey, you hurt me, I love you, I want to communicate, and you ask for forgiveness, and you hug each other, and you pray together, I'm telling you what God has planned to do to Vu Church and through Vu Church will not be stopped. So we're going to tend our path. You hear me? You're going to tend your path. That's what you're going to do. God's grace you to do it. You can look at that path and you tend it. And you care for your garden, so to speak. Care for it. Guard your heart from which flows the issues of life. There is greatness in seed form here. In seed form. But if you will tend the path, if you will tend the garden, it will flourish and become a tree that tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands can find rest, restoration, and shade, and belonging, and care, and love. Tend to your path. Tend to your heart. Tend to your life. Tend to your words. Tend to your eyes. Tend to your thoughts. Tend to your Attitude, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you don't know what that term means, we'll, we'll talk later. This isn't funny. Make straight paths for your feet, and I'm coming to a close, and, and um, I was going to say Samson, but that's inappropriate. My friend with uber long hair can join me. Um, <laughs> thanks, bro. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were sitting there. It's like super awkward, you know? I seriously did not know that. I love you so much. I'll see you soon. Um, so it says, <laughs> people amaze me. Can I just say, Vu Church, you absolutely amaze me. Ry Good and I are sitting in the back, and I'm like, who are all of these people? Like, like I, 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 I know that Vu Church currently can't pay most of the people that serve here. Like, we're growing. We're just starting. We're beginning. We're going to be able to have an amazing staff of hundreds of people. But right now, you are the most incredible, amazing volunteers with a heart to love people, serve this city, and serve the house. You are incredible. I want you to know that. I promise you this isn't normal. Please hear me. This is not normal. I hope it becomes the new normal. Normal is the new awesome, you know, and like steady living, but you are not normal. You're amazing people. And if together we will steward our path, make the path straight for your feet, comma, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Lame. Now that's not a popular term, of course, but what it means here, contextually, is that there were lame people in the community. Now, forgive the term, because in our modern context, you would never say, dude, you're so lame, right? You haven't said that since middle school. But lame literally meant it was Jewish believers who were caught between two opinions about who God is. That's all. And their opinion was this. Is he a Messiah still to come, or has the Messiah come? Who is God? Is he still this God or is he this God? And look what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, if you will live these level, consistent lives, attitude, heart, action, word, deeds, people in community who are caught between two opinions about God, over time, that lameness will get stronger. It'll get stronger. The truth about church it takes a long time. I had a friend recently move from our city to about two hours away, taking a, a coaching job in one of our major universities, and it's pretty awesome. And we hugged each other and cried. He, we've been together for 24 years, and he looked at me and he said these words, this church healed me. And I remember when he showed up at church. He was a wild man. I loved him. He was incredible. But you know what? My friend didn't get healed overnight. He had to watch. He had to wonder, is this real? Are these people legitimate? Are they authentic? And you know what? It didn't take a year. It didn't take two years. 24 years later, he looked at me and said, I'm healed. And I thought to myself, that's church. That's church. And maybe that doesn't fill a room automatically, but it'll change people's souls. See, what we have in front of us 
is an extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity that is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And that is to band together in this collective and in this co-op and commit to tend to our lifestyle. And over time, people will be added to the church as it pleases him, and they will come in disjointed. They will come in lame. They will come in torn between multiple opinions about who God is. Is God good? Is God gracious? Is God just? Is God reconciling the world to himself? Is God, is he really every Thing, and you know what they'll watch? Don't be fooled. YouTube? Sermons? Overrated. They'll watch you. They'll watch you. And they'll go to dinner with you, and then they'll finally have enough courage to come over to your house, and they'll watch you, and they'll watch you interact, and they'll watch you, and, and, and over time, they'll be healed. Voo Church is called by God to be a place where people get healed. And the Holy Spirit will use you to be an agent of healing. I end. I'm done with this. Luke 15 is this profound passage that has changed my life, and it has ultimately kind of framed for us what's happening in Seattle and L.A. and Guadalajara. It is in this parable, and I conclude, it is in this parable that Jesus is questioned by his critics why he has such a motley crew. In other words, he hangs out with disreputable people, and the pastors don't like it. And so they come blogging and critiquing and questioning, and Jesus says, let me explain. And he gives us three parables, and I'm done. The first parable, he tells about 100 sheep. The second parable, he tells about 10 coins. The last parable, he tells about two sons. And if you look at the picture in a totality, it becomes evidently clear to me that Jesus is saying, the reason I beloved these people is because I love people, and people are vulnerable prone to wandering, image-bearing children of infinite value to God. That's the message, right? The, sh the sheep, the coins, the sun, right? The sheep, wandering, vulnerable, right? Selfish, individualized people who bear the image of God, who are his children, who are of infinite value. And Jesus is saying, they're all my kids. They're, I know they're wandering. I know they struggle. I know, I know, but they, they, they look like me and, and they're my kids and I love them. And so you see them as disreputable people. I see them as my wayward children. So that's why I'm living the way I'm living. So he gets to the end of the parable as I get to the end of my message. And Luke 12, 32, have you, have you ever, ever read this? And I just feel like this is for Voo Church. It says, it was fitting, the father says. If you know the story of the two sons, the younger son goes away, spends all of his wasteful, all the money of his inheritance of his father, right? Comes back, kind of, the father sees him, runs to him, says, hey, I love you. And instead of disciplining his wayward son who wasted all the money, he gives him new clothes and jewelry and throws a big party with a DJ and they eat filet mignon. It's a big deal, right? Well, meanwhile, there's an older son who stayed in his dad's house. He was faithful. He was true. He was right. And from the field, he hears the music and the dancing, and he won't even go into the house. This will not be who we're going to be. This is not who Voo Church is. We're not going to stay outside. We're going to join the party of humanity, right? So he's out in the field. He's out in the field, and, and the father came out to him. Verse 28 says, and then he... He says, Dad, I, I never did anything wrong. Why, why didn't you do this for me? And he, he, says, he says, what? And, he, and, and, and the whole story ends. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's found. And then, and then the story just ends. And I was asking God one day, why does the prodigal son story, it just ends in this suspended scene out in the field. We don't even know if the older son ever comes in. The last scene we're privy to is the father with graciousness for both kids out in the field going, it was right. And the lights dim and the scene's over and that's all we get. It's like, did they reconcile? Did they? And I, it dawned on me one day, do you know why it ends like that? Because the story leaves you craving a true older brother. It leaves you craving. Do you see, we, in, in, in the story we think it's about two sons, but you know there's a third son telling the story. He's the son of the living God. And he's the true son. 
You know what that, you know what that older brother should have done? He should have saw his grieving father every day as his dad got out on the patio on the porch and looked down the street and looked down the road. And that older brother should have came out and said, Dad, his, his, you love this kid that much. Yes, son, I miss him every day. I'm so desperate for him to come back. Dad, are you serious? Okay, I'm going to go find him, Dad. I'm going to go, no, son. No, Dad, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be the son that I need to be. I'm going to be the brother I need to be. And I'm going to go find him wherever he is in the highways and the byways. Let us live a life that looks like the third son. Clear the path so that those who are lame might be healed. That's who we are. That's who Vu Church is. We're not staying in the field. We're joining the party in the house. All are welcome. All belong. All are loved. All are God's children. Can I hear an amen? Day after day, Every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. God is perfect, God is great, God is just, but I desire relationship, I desire a way to God, I can't get to God, so God came to us. Jesus is the way, and without him, all men are wanderers and vagabonds. Jesus is the truth, and without him, all 